Hi, I'm Allie, a test prep tutor and strategist at TestGeek. What's the deal with complex and imaginary numbers? We're going to cover everything you need to know about this math topic for the SAT or ACT. Simply put, imaginary numbers are any numbers that don't appear on the number line. Remember that number line where you can kind of figure out how far a number is from another number? Well, if you can't actually plot a number on this number line, it's imaginary. One example of this would be the square root of negative one. If you think about it, the square of any real number is positive, right? The square of one is one, because it's one times one, or one times itself, right? Same thing goes for the square of negative one. If we square negative one, we're doing negative one times negative one, which again gives us a positive. Any time we square something, we end up with a positive. You may know that the opposite of squaring a number is taking the square root of that number. If we took the square root of four, we would get plus or minus two, right? We can say two times two is four, and negative two times negative two is also four. Therefore, the square root of four is plus or minus two. But the problem is, when we try to take the square root of a negative number, we don't really know what to do, right? Because there is not a real number uh, that we can multiply by itself to get a negative number. So what do we do? Well, this is where imaginary numbers come in, because we want to be able to represent this idea, but we don't have a real number um, that works if we try to take the square root of a negative number. In order to handle this issue, we can represent the square root of negative one as i. Now this i represents the imaginary number that exists here. Um, it's not a real number, it's not a number we can plot on the number line, uh, but we want to be able to deal with this in math. We want to be able to like, uh, put it into an equation or multiply it by itself, things like that. And so in order to do that, we represent the square root of negative one as i. And that's how we handle imaginary numbers. And this is really important for the SAT and ACT because essentially any imaginary number problem really boils down to your understanding that i is equal to the square root of negative one. But what about complex numbers? What are complex numbers and how do we deal with them for the SAT or ACT? Sometimes people will interchange the word imaginary and complex numbers, but technically that's not correct. These two things are a little bit different. Uh, so a complex number is the sum of a real number and an imaginary number. So something like five plus i, or three minus two i. Those would both be complex numbers. For the SAT or ACT, it all comes down to your ability to handle i. Remember that i equals the square root of negative one. This is so important to remember. Representing the square root of negative one like this allows us to be able to do all the regular operations on the square root of negative one without actually having a real number for it. So i squared is negative one. Because remember i is the square root of negative one, so we can multiply that by itself, square root of negative one times square root of negative one. Now, if you remember your rules for square roots, when we multiply two square roots um, by themselves, um, or you know, two of the same square root by each other, uh, then those square roots cancel out and we get the number that's inside of the square root. So in this case, that would be negative one. And you're gonna want to remember that rule um, when you think about multiplying i by itself multiple times. Um, so i cubed is negative one i because it's square root of negative one times square root of negative one times square root of negative one. So again, those first two will turn into um, a negative one and then we're multiplying that by square root of negative one, which remember is i. You probably see what we're trying to do here. We kind of have to simplify things and remember our basic rules of the square root of negative one is equal to i. And remember those rules for square roots and how they work when you multiply things by each other. Um, so you can certainly memorize these things. Like you can memorize that i cubed is equal to negative one i, or you can just remember that i is the square root of negative one and you can kind of work it out if you need to. So either way will work we can actually raise i to any power that we want. And this is why it's important to kind of understand how these rules work, is that if you see something like i to the fourth on the SAT or ACT, you wanna be able to work that out yourself and kind of make sense of it on the test. Remember that a complex number is the sum of a real number and an imaginary number. So something like eight plus i. But the reality is on the SAT or ACT, you might see something a bit more complicated, like seven minus i squared equals x plus six. 
this looks a little hard, right? A little tricky, uh, a lot more complicated than something like eight plus I. But don't stress, we're gonna focus on using what we know about I to turn our imaginary numbers into real numbers as quickly as possible. Then we're gonna end up with a problem that looks a lot less scary. So what did we say that I squared was? Negative one, right? So let's replace I squared with negative one. So then we're gonna have seven minus, in parentheses, negative one, equals x plus six. Okay, perfect. So now it's just a basic algebra problem, right? So this looked really scary, but if we know the basic rule of what i is, that i squared is negative one, or just remember that i equals the square root of negative one, we're all set. So now we're gonna go ahead and solve this. So we have, like I said, seven minus, actually that's gonna turn into a plus, right? So seven plus one equals x plus six. Um, so then we can combine our terms on the left. So that's gonna be eight equals x plus six. And then let's go ahead and subtract the six from the right side um, and the left side. So then we end up with two equals x. So if they're asking for x on the SAT or ACT, then we've solved it. Um, we have two as our answer. Let's look at a few more example problems. Which of the following complex numbers is equal to four plus three i times five minus two i, for i equals the square root of negative one? Okay, so we wanna start by probably trying to combine like terms, because if we look at our answers, um, you can see that it's just one um, term, right? We have like 20 plus i or 20 plus six i, so we don't have any like parentheses or anything like that. So that should probably tell you that we're gonna have to combine some terms together at some point in order to solve this. So let's maybe try to FOIL this. If you remember first, outer, inner, last, um, when we have two terms like this being multiplied. So let's go ahead and do that and just see what we get. Um, sometimes with problems like this, there isn't maybe a direct obvious way to solve it, but we wanna just take one step at a time um, and go from there. So let's do first, outer, inner, last, or foil this and see what we get. So this would be four times five, so that's gonna be 20, and then four times negative two i, so that would be negative eight i, and then three i times five is 15 i, and then minus three i times, um, negative two i. So that's gonna be minus six i squared. Okay, so I think I may have said two negatives there, but it's actually just one, right? Because we assume everything's gonna be added together, but in this case, we have this negative sign, so we kinda have to deal with that. Okay, so is there anything that we can combine together? Yes, right, we have eight i and 15 i. And this is where you can kinda think about the i a little bit like a variable. It's not exactly like a variable, but in terms of trying to combine like terms, um, it is. So we can leave our 20 by itself, and then what's negative eight plus 15? So that's gonna be seven, right? So now we have seven i, and then minus six i squared. Okay, so what is i squared? This is where it's really important to remember that, right? Um, so we're gonna try to simplify this a little bit. So anytime you see i squared, i cubed, i to the fourth, anything like that, you wanna try to get it into a real number as quickly as possible, and that's gonna help you do that. So remember, i squared is equal to negative one, so we can simply plug in negative one for i. So now we have 20 plus seven i minus six times negative one. And we end up with 20 plus seven i plus six. And now we can combine terms, right? So we have 26 plus seven i. And if we look at our answer choices, that answer is c. Okay, nice work. Let's look at another problem. This one looks pretty tough, right? We know that we need to simplify this, but it's probably unclear exactly how we would do that. The good news is that this exact style of question is fairly common when it comes to imaginary number problems on the SAT or ACT. So this trick that I'm gonna walk you through should serve you well on either test. In mathematics, you may have heard of the conjugate. The conjugate of our denominator is five minus four i. So you see, we're just flipping the sign here. And we can simplify this expression that we have in our problem by multiplying the top and the bottom by the conjugate of our denominator. I know this seems kind of random, but this is really gonna help us to simplify things and you're gonna see why. So let's multiply these out now. Let's use our FOIL method. 
Now what can we simplify on the top and the bottom? Well, we can combine like terms on the top, so we can combine our negative 16i and our negative 10i, and we'll get 20 minus 26i plus 8i squared. And on the bottom, we can actually cancel out these two middle terms, right? And this is the magic of why we want to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator, is because we can actually cancel this out on the bottom. So we're gonna cancel those two terms out and we get 25 minus 16i squared. And now, what do we remember about i squared? It's equal to negative one, right? So let's replace all of our i squareds with negative one. So on the top, we get 20 minus 26i minus eight, and on the bottom, 25 plus 16. So let's combine like terms again. So we get 12 minus 26i all over 41. Now's a good point to definitely look at our answer choices and see what we have going on. So A and B are not gonna work, right? They don't have any I, so that makes no sense for the type of answer that we got. Um, so we're gonna cross those out, and let's look at C and D now. So for C, we have 12 over 41 minus 26i over 41. And this might look a little different than our answer choice, right? Because we actually have just one fraction in our answer that we got. But remember that if you have um, a denominator and you have two terms on the top, you can actually split up that fraction into two parts and just keep that denominator the same. Or if you want to do it in reverse for our answer choices, because it's the same denominator, we can te could technically combine this into one fraction. So C is actually going to be our answer because we could split this up as 12 over 41 minus 26i over 41. Okay, nice work on that one. I know it was a little bit tricky, but I hope that that makes sense. I know it seems a little random, but if you can remember that trick, it'll really help you if you see that type of problem on the SAT or ACT. Feeling confident working with imaginary and complex numbers is important if you wanna win back as many points as possible on these tests. They aren't terribly common on the SAT or ACT math sections, but you don't wanna lose any points. And this is something that's pretty simple, right? As long as you understand what I is equal to, how to kind of work with I squared or I cubed, you are gonna be in good shape. You don't have to master every type of imaginary number problem. You really just need to understand the basics of how to work with I, and how to work with these types of problems. You wanna kind of foil things out or expand things out as much as possible and get to those real numbers as quickly as you can. With that strategy, I'm sure you'll be able to master imaginary and complex number problems on the SAT or ACT. Thanks for joining me. If you're looking for more content like this, make sure you hit subscribe and you can also find us at testgeek.com forward slash blog.